Man Champs, another sort of 80, I was going to say 80 days there, 80 years uh, thing we jig. And for an episode of British history uh, that is sem uh, rarely really known or talked about, I mean, people know that it happened, but it, it sort of, I wouldn't say brushed under the carpet, it just sort of overlooked in the greater picture. Uh, the Channel Islands. On the 30th of June, for the first and only time in the Second World War, German troops landed on British soil, soil even, in the shape of uh, Guernsey, and proceeded then to occupy the other islands. And as I say, those that they could occupy anyway. Aside from the main four, old in the Guernsey, Jersey and Sark, there's a fair few others that you'd be lucky to get a suitcase on, never mind uh, a bunch of Germans. And you've got Bartel, for instance, that now I believe is owned by the Barclay Brothers, the, million, the billionaires, I should say, who run one of our newspapers, I forget which, probably the Telegraph. Uh, however, the Channel Islands uh, represent rather a peculiar, well, rather unusual part of uh, history, this history of the Second World War, in the sense that they were British and the only British territory taken by the Germans in the Second World War. And of course, things were meant to be massively different after their initial occupation. At the start of the war, I can't imagine Hitler, that onwards down, was well aware of the islands or cared about the islands. Uh, but needless to say, as the Battle of France was unfolding at a rate of knots in late May, early June, with the evacuation of Dunkirk and subsequent evacuations of the likes of uh, Brest, Le Havre, Saint Nazaire, and what happened at Saint Valery, the Channel Islands came into increasing focus. Geographically, of course, they are much, much, much closer to France than they are British, and historically, They've sort of sat somewhere between the two. Uh, according to a couple of books I've read about the uh, Channel Island occupation, uh, they always claim to own Britain because they were part of the Duke of Normandy, aka William the Conqueror, prior to him invading England. So they they were part of Normandy in those days. So they sort of own. They're no their crown. I was going to say the crown colonies are not really the exact. They have their own parliaments. Uh, the names of which every history video I managed to forget their sailing detail. <laughs> but they have their own parliament, they have uh, bailiffs in charge. I give up sometimes. But um, nonetheless, they are British, they have pounds, they have various British uh, things along with it. However, they have a sort of smack infusion of French throughout their. Uh, Society, you know, like uh, for instance, the great footballer. Well, I say great, he's a Southampton player, Matt Letizia, Graham Lasso, You know, uh, there's French names, and uh, yeah, very English feel to things, as you see in the TV show Bergerac. Which, if it wasn't for Bergerac, I probably would never have known about the Channel Islands in any shape or form, or knew what they looked like, or knew that they were even ours. You don't see the French kicking off about getting these islands back, and own to their location, I don't think they quite know where to go sometimes. Um, unlike mainland Britain, they've been able to deal with the coronavirus uh, much better. I mean, you can lock down islands, and the islands being as small as they are, they're not really, uh, you know, population is spread where it is. And as they've had deaths on the islands from coronavirus but from the looks of it the outbreak is mostly contained now it's sort of like how New Zealand's dealt with it and the Falklands 8,000 miles to the southwest and little bits of Britain all the same they've had 13 cases 13 recovered uh, however uh, sports wise uh, you now have a Guernsey football team playing in the what they call the English Pyramid. So there is a world beyond for the Football League, and they play in the Ishmian League. What do they call it now? Southeast or South? Because um, they base it on where <laughs> their region is, respectively, where the airport is. So the airport is Gatwick, and that is in the footprint of the Ishmian, which is usually teams for Kent, London, and 
bits of Sussex and the like, and Hampshire, that's how the number of Waterloo found, found. And Guernsey, pay for the opponents to come over, pay the airfare. They have a fantastic support for that division and have done in the three, uh, in the three divisions they've played in. They've had two promotions and so far no relegations. And they are a dedicated Guernsey FC. And now you have Jersey Bulls who play two divisions below them and should have gone up this season, 2019-20, because they won every single one of their matches. No defeats, no losses. And I've only conceded three or six goals, so they've got a stupidly good goal difference. They were technically promoted before Corona started, and then non-league football from what they call steps three, which is just below, which is below Conference North and South, all the way down to seven, where Jersey play. Yes, that's the division. Um, Null and void, so no one's being promoted. So there you go, they, and apparently there used to be some Guernsey teams playing in the French football system years ago. So, come the Battle of France 1940, as I say, the enemy is gradually drawing itself closer and closer. Cherbourg is taken at some point, and around about the middle of June 1940, the British government made the decision to demilitarise the islands and effectively evacuate those who want to go but who should go, like the children and certain other people. There was nothing militarily to keep these islands going under the auspices of the army, say. As I say, the islands, as, it were, as you'd see during the occupation, are such a size that I would have thought it would not be prudent to sort of launch a spirited defence of somewhere like St Helier, St Helier even, St Peter Port and anywhere else on the islands. For a start you're going to involve the civilian population a lot closer than you would say if the Germans had invaded Kent, uh, you know you've got open, large open countryside and parts of Kent whereas Channel Islands though it is as Bertrand showed me, big enough to get lost in, perhaps. Um, you can't, it's, you, the losses of civilians would just be untold, probably. Not a, not a massacre, but just there's no point. And unfortunately, the islands were more or less left to their own devices. And I say unfortunately, I like to think that deep down somewhere, Churchill probably thought to himself, I've left a bunch of British people in the lurch. And that was kind of one driving force of Mrs. Thatcher sending the task force to... Uh, the Falklands, in the sense that there were British people being subjugated against their will, let's go and help them. So I'm sure Churchill, if he could, would have done something. But the trouble is, they were that close to France, and it what was it when the ferries used to leave for three hours in the 90s and 2000s, anyway? They were out of sight and almost out of mind. And again, that you'd see that later in the war. So they're demilitarised, people being evacuated, and they could see the signs of battle gradually approaching, you know, terror, columns of smoke from somewhere, probably maybe Cherbourg, and possibly the sounds of gunfire, artillery, and then even, once uh, the Germans reached the coast, uh, on the clifftops or wherever. Uh, my French geography west of Cherbourg gets a little bit murky, but they're there. And so the locals are thinking, well, you know, they, they, the war propaganda from the off was similar to the war propaganda of the First World War. You know, the Germans were butchers, and I don't know thought they were going back to the babies on bayonets, but there was a lot said, and so they're, they're scared witless, probably, the Channel Islanders. Do they feel that Britain has betrayed them? Probably. Yeah, I would imagine it would be awfully hard not to feel something about Winston Churchill and the government in 1940. And I, uh, there's a faintly surreal air as they're waiting for the Germans. And the hope is, at any rate, that they're not going to do anything. Now, for reasons best known to themselves, the Germans bombed Jersey and Guernsey a couple of days before they eventually landed on the 28th of June. And it was when the evacuation was still going on and people were killed. A few dozen. Guernsey, when it was hit, there were, if I remember a photograph and some story quickly, there was uh, horse and carts with crate loads of tomatoes, and some, and it looked like there had been an actual bloodbath, 
and though people were killed, it hadn't left that kind of mess, it was the tomatoes. The Germans probably thought that there was something on the island worth bombing, that there was a military presence despite what the British had told them, and better safe than sorry, bomb the harbour like you would do in a Prelude 2 invasion. It's a little bit cloudy why they did it, but I'd imagine it was for military reasons, not reasons of humanity at any rate. So on the 30th of June, chap in charge of Guernsey Sherwell uh, gets a knock on his door and there's a couple, uh, there's a, somebody saying that the Germans have landed at the airport, which is not like a Heathrow airport kind of looking place like you'd have now. Uh, a couple of buildings, a grass runway, and it's a Junkers. And then next thing you know, there's a couple of German officers at the door. He asks them to come in through the back door so it's not to wake his children. The Germans say, certainly. And then next thing you know, the swastika is flying over the Channel Islands. For some reason, the Germans left it to the next day to take over Jersey. And then in a the couple of days after that, Sark followed suit and Alderney. Alderney's population are more or less all gone. And Alderney, as far as the Channel Islands went, and I suppose British history, because as I say, no one really is aware of it as such, uh, became the only part of British soil to have a concentration camp placed upon it later in the occupation. And that's the thing. The Channel Islands might not have been the biggest territory the Germans had taken. I mean, you could have fit all the islands within Luxembourg, and or at least several times over in France and there were something like at one point three Germans to every islander and yet there were this little slice of Britain as I was saying. It's cur I always find it fascinating the occupation of Channel Islands not in a kind of delightful way but just historically when I read that there was a book called The Model Occupation by a lady called Madeleine Bunting, I thought it was about uh, the planned invasion of Britain. So such was my knowledge about the Channel Islands being invaded. And then I, I got f awfully fascinated with it. You know, the generals at one point said Hitler had island madness. He was awfully fixated, apparently, with the Channel Islands. And I wouldn't call it my fixation island madness, but it's just little slices of Britain, as I say, that were occupied by the Germans. And when I was doing my dissertation about British resistance methods in the event of a German invasion, and to a point how the Germans might have done it, as much as my tutor got really irritated, I, in the last chapter, used the Channel Islands, and I was saying how the Channel Islands were meant to be what the occupation of Britain might have looked like. But they weren't fairly feasible, whether as a model of occupation, or indeed resistance from the British. What the islanders had going against them was the geography of the islands to France rather than Britain. So where would any islander who's just blown up a car escape to occupy France? What would happen in the event that you have blown up a car? Well, very swiftly the Germans would be able to lock down things a lot quicker than they probably would have done on mainland Britain or anywhere in occupied Europe. And take hostages and as they did in places like Poland and Czech Republic, well, Czechoslovakia and um, most places, shoot them, you know, 20 hostages for every German killed or something. And that was impractical, it was, oh, it was impractical in a way and it, theoretically impossible. So assistance had to be done in much more subtle methods, be it the lady who stitched high, um, bad things about Hitler into a cushion and uh, there was another islander who kept saying Hohiller to her and she would greet her with a high old Churchill. Be it hiding prisoners of war that were escaping from the organisation top places on Jersey and Guernsey because Hitler wanted these islands incorporated into the Atlantic wall defences. Be it uh, those from the concentration camp on Alderney. There was subtle things, the fee sign and everything else. So they weren't practical as an example of what would have happened in Britain. What would have happened in Britain was, would have been, I think, vastly different to what did happen on the islands. Similarly, the German occupation of the Channel Islands was, was probably going to be replicated on mainland Britain, but only so far. I mean, for a start, as I say, there were many more Germans to any islander. And there was only a handful of Jews. 
and they all disappeared to the mainland. And that it remains an episode in the Channel Islands history that is not covered in glory because there's a suggestion that a few of them were handed in or dobbed, grassed up by islanders and it was the Guernsey Police Force that escorted some, uh, some of these people to the harbour, not just the Gestapo. And that's something else, of course. Though this video is not really, is minimal, the anniversary of the day they fell, what followed in those five years is still controversial. I mean, Madeline Bunting, when she wrote her book, which I think is probably the best book I've read on the occupation, and this was written, or at least published in 1995-1996, so that would have been just a little over 50 years after the liberation. She had great problems writing it from some of the local. I think she says that she received, I think she might receive threats. And certainly, and certainly that would have been true immediately after the war. Yeah, there you go. How dare you English come over here dictating and pontificating about things which you know nothing, absolutely nothing about. Would you English have done any different? Live those who lived through it to write the history of the occupation. You can't ever understand what it was like. And dear old John Nettles who played Bergerac, who wanted desperately to live on the islands but initially they wouldn't let him for some reason and then he did get to live on the islands and he's done great things for Jersey tourism I would have thought. Uh, he did a documentary thing for UK TV history about the occupation and apparently he lost a bunch of friends overnight when he went about and saying that you know essentially that the island, some of the islanders betrayed other islanders. So in that respect the Channel Islands became British authorities a microcosm of what was happening in occupied France. Uh, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Denmark, Poland, um, Poland again, Russia, and anywhere else that the German swastika flew over. And it's unpalatable because it's British, and the British don't do bad things, you know, they don't grass up when well, they do, unfortunately. And coronavirus has shown that British nature hasn't changed much since the Second World War. And unlike other occupied territories, those that col collaborated with the enemy were never really dealt with. Some were sort of deported from the islands for their own safety. And then you're left with, like all the other occupied territories, uh, a bunch of children that had been born as a direct result of what you might call closer collaboration with the enemy. Apparently some of the Channel Islanders called these women jerry bags or... Um, Apparently there was a lady, I think, on Jersey walking down the street, pregnant or pregnant, and one of the locals called out to his mates or her mates, uh, look, look, look out, guys, here comes a German troop carrier. That in itself is inevitable, I suppose, much like the collaboration. Uh, you know, French women had relationships, some quite serious with the occupiers, some were just, you know, casual. That happened in Holland and Belgium, elsewhere. It kind of ha happened in the camps, but not always by choice, of course. Why would the Channel Islands be any different? Wartime is what it was. And also, you know, like I say, the Germans went in there with a few eventually to occupy and invade in Britain itself. Uh, they were telling the locals this was a stepping off point for a larger for the invasion of Britain. The local as far as the locals were perhaps concerned, now that the Germans were here, they seemed unstoppable. They just rolled out Europe in a few weeks. Um, the war wasn't gonna end in their favour, so maybe he can't stop human nature. And these people assumed of course that either the Germans would win or maybe they would have hope of just hope, I don't know. And initially, the occupation was a novelty for the Germans, of course, you know, the, the gift shops were pillaged. I think Goebbels ended up with a paper rate, no, a snow globe, perhaps. One of the two, he had something from the islands, and it was, and that, despite the fact they were expecting to carry on to Britain, there was like, we've taken, you know, there was, you got pictures 
Now the famous one that's on the front cover of the model occupation of a German soldier or officer talking to a British Bobby. There were red telephone boxes everywhere. Uh, the, uh, I think there's a picture of German headquarters on Jersey or Guernsey and it's the AA building perhaps, uh, the Automobile Association as we call it. And the Royal Air Force officer, you know, there's all these signs in English and there's German soldiers. It is a much potent impact than perhaps standing next to a sign in Norwegian or Belgium, or, or well, I say Belgian, Flemish, as awful as it was. I mean, for the British, you know, seeing a German soldier standing by a sign with a very British AA, it's devastating. So five years of occupation are ahead of the islanders, and they were liberated after V Day on the 9th of May. And uh, the British were initially practicing for a full-scale fight, but the fight had been knocked out of the Germans. What the British probably didn't realize, and no one seemed to realize, was that after D-Day, the fortune of the islanders, be it the occupied or the occupier, went south massively. I mean, not long after D-Day, the Allies took Cherbourg, and they could see the signs of battle like they had in 1940. And then next thing you know, the sounds about all sort of disappear and somehow they're aware of the forces heading south through France towards Germany and it felt like they had been forgotten again, even betrayed and as it entered the winter of 44-45 there was no sign the British or the Americans were coming to get them and the winter was one of the worst on record and what with them being cut off from Germany now and supplies Food was running out and they were effectively on the verge of a famine. The Red Cross ended up helping the islanders out. The, the Admiral in charge towards the end wanted sort of like a last weed out, like Dunkirk and Brest and the like, but uh, thankfully for the islanders, he, there was no fight put. HMS, uh, not Bulldog. The ships turn up, they liberate the islanders, and since then, you know, you have Liberation Day on British territory. But it is a thorny subject. And um facet of British history that as I said not many people are aware of or are entirely bothered about. Had Britain followed suit in the Channel Islands, this would all be for moot. But as it was, the islands were occupied, and as I say, remained occupied all the way through to May 1945. So that is your rather convoluted Channel Islands video, and um, check out the model occupation if you can. I've not bothered with the dozen or so new books that have came out since then. Maybe I should for a more modern appreciation. And you've got an older book called The um, Gould Islands in Danger by Mary and Alan Seatonwood, I believe, because I used it during my dissertation. So there you go, chaps. The Channel Islands.